This is an account of a very personal odyssey that I took back in the spring, four weeks in a canoe that I designed and built myself along the Northern Forest Canoe Trail. Now, anyone who has done anything momentous in their life will probably attest to the fact that it can raise some pretty powerful emotions. This is me at the end, with the canoe and the paddle, um, having a, a fairly intensely emotional time of it. And um, these, are, these have been my faithful companions for the last 750 miles over four weeks through hell and high water, and as you're about to find out. Now, it, um, it all started back in the mid-90s when Vivica, who's now my wife, and I found this canoe literally in a wood pile. It was a bit of a wreck. <laughs> It wasn't going to float too well. And with limited expertise, we restored it. And that was the boat that introduced me to the wilderness that only a small craft can access. Big problem, it weighed about 92 pounds. <laughs> um, so carrying was less than comfortable. And it was during those carries that I started mulling over the idea of starting from scratch and building a cedar strip boat that was much lighter. So let's do some quick fast forwarding. 2003, came to this country, got married. Um, 2004, built a, a garage and workshop. To 2007, my first canoe, one of my own design, came out of the workshop, weighing something less than half of the original one that we had. And it was out paddling that one that summer in the Adirondacks, that we met somebody who was paddling the Northern Forest Canoe Trail. And that's the first time the trail had entered my consciousness. And it sowed a seed, one of those that germinates really slowly. And um, in the end, I was talking about not so much if I would paddle the trail, but when. So moving on, another canoe design ensued, this one with more of a touring hull. And this one was completed in June last year and weighed 35 pounds, it's a 14 footer, 35 pound solo. And the trials were successful. At least they didn't say. <laughs> exactly, that's what I mean by successful. <laughs> and that was the instant at which this became my trail boat and therefore I was sort of very close at that point in making the decision, yes, I'm going to do it, and I'm going to do it soon. And soon happened to be this year. So that's when the preparation began, and there was a lot of mental preparation, working through maps and Google Earth, that sort of thing. Um, a lot of practical preparation. Come on in, come on in. A lot of practical preparation, things like buying a whole load more dry bags. <laughs> of portentous. And um, kitting out the canoe with knee pads for kneeling, arranging how to stow paddles and poles, life jacket, so that I could still carry the thing without upsetting the balance. Training? That was on... I did most of my training on white water, below Middlebury Falls. Thanks to Rick here in the front for taking the next couple of pictures. Um, white water training was... Well, white water was the experience that I most lacked. Canoe camping, no problem. White water in a canoe, done plenty in a kayak, not that much in a canoe. So that was, so forget the facial expression. <laughs> <laughs> vaguely, vaguely ape-like. Now the Northern Forest Canoe Trail, it's um. It's not just a single waterway, it's a series of more or less interconnected waterways. And they're very traditional waterways. They have been used for trade as war paths, as military and industrial highways, as um, more recently recreational pathways. And it starts over in the southwestern Adirondacks in Old Forge, cuts across the Adirondacks to Lake Champlain, up the Missisquoi across northern Vermont with a loop through Quebec, um, Lake Memphremagog, across northeastern Vermont, across northern New Hampshire, and way up into northern Maine 
to finish at Fort Kent on the St. John River. The official distance, 740 miles. Upstream and down, white water, placid water, big lakes, small ponds, the works. The next one, this, this shows you the red at the beginning here. That's Old Forge, that's the starting point. The other pins are my overnight points along the way. Well, other than the end here, which wasn't an overnight. It was the end. <laughs> my timing was flexible when I set out. The only, the only definite I was aiming for was a music gig in the Connecticut Valley. About two weeks in. <laughs> You've got to make a living somehow. So let's, let's get this trip underway. And um, the first chapter is going to take us across the Adirondacks as far as Lake Champlain. The beginning. Set out on the 19th of May. And um, there I'm looking sort of clean, clean shaven green and first day I made good mileage at 18 miles where I proposed my first campsite might be it was on the island up there I was feeling good so I went straight past it got as far as Racket Lake and slept in a lean-to that night and I remember thinking at that point so far it's just a day trip true so far. By tomorrow it'll be a camping trip. Tomorrow came and that, the route took me to the north of Racket Lake over into a carry into Forked Lake down the Racket River along the full length of Long Lake. Anyone who's paddled Long Lake will recognize that as one of the iconic views of the Adirondacks. <coughs> and um, then down more of the Racket River to its junction with Stony Creek, which is where I camped for the night. That was over 39 miles that day. Um, and I was feeling good with it. It was just a long day, nothing strenuous about it. And one of my goals there was actually to gain a bit of time on my proposed schedule because my schedule didn't allow for any delays. <laughs> so um, but at this point I was around about half a day ahead. That night, a thunderstorm struck about two or three in the morning. I've jumped ahead. Camping. I didn't use a tent. I used a camping hammock. Small, soft, light, no rigid parts, stuffs away to nothing. Very easy. String it up between two trees. This is the Northern Forest Canoe Trail. Trees are not in short supply. Um, and it also means that you don't have to look for flat ground without rocks and tree roots and the rest of it. So that was, that was my home for the next month or so. Thunderstorm in the middle of the night. One end of the tarp here blew off. Rain started pouring into the hammock onto my sleeping bag. I stumbled around in the dark trying to fix this, having totally forgotten to take a headlamp, any kind of lamp, to bed with me. And it, fairly obviously, I was not at that stage in a camping groove, <laughs> something that had to be rectified pretty quickly. Next morning, absolutely no trace of the thunderstorm that had gone through, other than, of course, a damp sleeping bag and also damp firewood that I'd gathered and not put under cover. The significance of that becomes apparent when you realize that for cooking, I was relying on a wood burning stove. Flat pack, five sheets of metal that erects into that, pick up wood along the way, stuff it in the side and light it. As it burns off, you push the wood in further. Less than six ounces, works beautifully if the wood's dry. <laughs> there were times on this trip that I couldn't even get birch bark to <laughs> burn. Any time that I couldn't maintain a fire, I couldn't have any hot drink or hot food. I was living on trail mix and cold water. 
which is not the best. Now, it's probably worth mentioning something at this stage about the weather. I mentioned that thunderstorm. I had a thunderstorm on night two, also on night three, for most of the afternoon and the night of day four. After that, I had fairly continuous rain for several days in a row, <laughs> with unseasonally cold temperatures over Memorial Day weekend. If you remember Memorial Day weekend, <laughs> 34 inches of snow on White Face Mountain in the Adirondacks, 16 and a half inches of snow on Mount Mansfield. Burlington saw seven inches of rain in five days. Roads were washed away in Jericho. <laughs> yeah. I'd been worried for the first half of May and the end of April, which were dry, about water levels in the river. <laughs> this was a worry that I didn't have for very long. The rain actually started within two hours of my leaving Old Forge. And um, there's one more thing I was going to say about the weather, but I seem to have forgotten that. Oh, yes, of course. Yeah, even though the first two weeks of May were dry, Vermont ended up having the wettest May on record. And June, for good measure. So, moving on. My route took me up Stony Creek, across the Indian Carry into the Saranac drainage, whereupon it's now a downhill run all the way to Lake Champlain. This is middle Saranac Lake. Further down the Saranac River, that's a picture somebody took of me going through Saranac Lake Village. Um, further down the Saranac River, I came to the first rapids, permanent rapids, just beginning round the corner there. And paddling a wooden canoe, I'd always planned to be cautious about white water. And on the approach to these rapids, which I'd planned to carry around, about a mile and a quarter carry, no problem, I thought, if I back out of this rapid, how many more such rapids, class two rapids, am I going to back out of? Some point, I've got to find out what it's going to do. So, adopted a kneeling position, put my life jacket on, switched over to my shorter white water paddle, and paddle straight past the takeout, the point of no return. And it was going fine. It was going wonderfully. A lot of back paddling, controlling speed. And then I just got one thing wrong. And pushed up on a rock and then dropped sideways off it onto another one. Couldn't do much about the crack at that point. It was, it was, it was loud. Um, but once I'd camped for the night, then all I found was a 10-inch split in the internal fiberglass. The outside was fine, and the hull was still rigid, so I just slapped some tape over it, keep water out. That was good for the end, good to the end. Another thunderstorm that night. <laughs> well, just after I'd finished cooking a meal, such intense rain that it was bouncing off the ground and up to soak the underside of my hammock. <laughs> <laughs> and a squall of wind that just blew all of the fire out of my stove, <laughs> literally. Um, anyway, moving on. The, the Saranac further down, down river is a, a, white, a white water river, most of the rest of the way to Plattsburgh. And following my questionable success on um, permanent rapids, I decided to give the trail rapids a go, and the silver lining of the storms was there was plenty of water in them. It was made lovely paddling and negotiated those absolutely fine. And where the rapids become a little more serious, I took out for a hike along the road. I didn't want to miss too much. That would miss the point of the trip. But um, certainly any serious rapids, I, I was OK taking out and carrying along the road to miss that stretch. And rather perversely, the sun came out for that carry. So it was a hot, <laughs> sticky carry. <laughs> If it, just in case you're wondering if I saw any sun at all. I was underneath the canoe at the time. <laughs> There's a, another picture of those rapids further down. And then, oh yeah, <laughs> carrying on that day, more thunderstorms, thunder and lightning more or less simultaneous. As I carried on down the, um, down the Saranac River, and it carried on all that night, no, no wood that I could burn, cold food and drink for dinner and breakfast. 
and then more rapids, more class one and two rapids, all the way into Plattsburgh the next day. There's the, the entrance into Plattsburgh. Great paddling. Uh, I wish I'd been able to have some food and hot drink, but that's another matter. And then suddenly, from paddling on this sort of stuff, you emerge into Lake Champlain. And the first thing you have to do is a three-mile crossing to Cumberland Head. And the swell there doesn't really show in the picture. It's between two and three feet, about 30, 30 inches of swell. And swell is fine. Chop is a little more uncomfortable. Swell, you just ride over it. And rounding Cumberland Head, I then made my way. This is the crossing to Cumberland Head. I made my way up along South Hero and eventually pulled in at North Hero. And that completed about 160 miles in less than five days. And at that point, Viveka came to meet me. She took me to a friend's house for the night and had the first hot shower of the trip and also some good food. This brings us to the next chapter, which takes us across the rest of Lake Champlain and up the Missisquoi to Canada and covers the weather I was talking about earlier of um, Memorial Day weekend. Oh. Next morning. Oh, no, this isn't the next morning. This is just showing where I've got to that day. <coughs> next morning, put back in at North Hero, exactly where I'd taken out. And, um, well, the forecast wind speed was 15 to 20 miles an hour, and that was clearly an underestimate. So I took the, what's called the carrying place, even though you don't have to carry, through into the Arlberg Passage to try to get some shelter. And even there, um, it was a battle to make progress, head down into the wind, paddling. Th this was really the start of nine and a half hours of the most brutal paddling that I think I've ever undertaken. It's really brutal. Um, head down into the wind. The wind was driving rain down my neck, up my cuffs. And that these are with close-fitting cuffs. It was um, just whistling past me, taking body heat away, and it was only really the strenuous paddling that was generating enough heat to keep my body temperature up. If I stopped, I could feel my body temperature sinking. <coughs> Don't look too hard at the water surface. <laughs> of course, you're all doing that now. <laughs> it's a little pockmarked. That's the Route 78 bridge up there. Up near that bridge, I was leaning back, sponging out rainwater from behind me, copious rainwater that was accumulating. And suddenly, I was lying flat on my back in the back of the canoe, the rear rail of the seat had cracked and fallen out. I'd just overloaded it. Not much you can do about that. I put it back in place and adopted a kneeling position, lowered the front edge and put my weight partially on the front rail of the seat and carried on. Now from that bridge, that's up here, I could have taken the long exposed route to the Missisquoi Delta, except the wind was coming down from the north-northwest, 25 plus miles an hour. That was not going to be a comfortable place to be. So I hugged the shore pretty much up to the Canadian border, maybe over it, I'm not too sure, before then setting out amid somewhere near three foot chop now, which was uncomfortable to cross to the Missisquoi Delta. It's it, the kind of conditions where you actually have to be comfortable in your boat's handling and your own abilities. Otherwise, you've got no business being there. Um, as soon as I hit the Missisquoi Delta, it became pretty obvious that Vermont had seen a lot of rain. And this rain was now funneling down the Missisquoi towards me. This is the point where it began something over 70 miles of upstream paddling in flood conditions. <laughs> <laughs> you think it's funny? <laughs> it <is> now. <laughs> <laughs> you have to laugh, otherwise. <laughs> um, yeah, there's an art to paddling upstream, choosing which side of the river to be on. Where, where are the eddies strongest? 
judging how frequently to cross over the river, probably losing ground to do so, merely to get access to stronger eddies, planting the paddle where possible in the slackest water to get maximum propulsion. And I was busy working all this out in my, in my head and also wondering what I'm going to do about this rear rail of the seat, processing all of this stuff, and suddenly I'm sitting that much lower and the front rail of the seat has now cracked. I've got no seat. So, I take to sitting, uh, to kneeling, sitting on my heels, paddling, and it's, it's okay, it's quite comfortable. I hadn't really planned on doing that all the way to northern Maine. <laughs> <laughs> and paddling along like that, I was thinking, you know, what I could really do with is something like an exercise ball. Because I could sit astride that and it would be comfortable. It would work. Bear in mind that I'm now about six hours into a day of seriously strenuous paddling. It's bitter conditions, driving north-northwest wind, heavy, intense rain for most of the time. I've got a broken seat. The whole trip really is in jeopardy. A positive outlook is, a, is difficult to maintain. About a couple of miles further up, it was highly surreal then to come across floating in an eddy. <laughs> <laughs> a ball. Disney fairies. <laughs> Believe what you will. <laughs> Sat on that ball and paddled sort of buoyed by this improbable good fortune, all the way up to Swanton. You can see the water piling over the dam there. And um, I was very glad to be able to spend the night in the, in the motel there. Yes. <laughs> Next morning, one of the first things to do was to work out what to do with the seat. A piece of cherry shouldn't really look like that. So I went into Aubuchon, Bought some aluminium angle, some nylon cord, and lashed the angle to the seat, both rails, and put it back in the canoe, and it worked. I wasn't totally confident that it would last for the next three weeks, so the ball came with me. <laughs> My insurance policy, because a second one wasn't going to turn up if I really needed it. <laughs> Then, back to the river. Got back to the river, it was flowing much higher and faster than the previous day. I could barely reach the takeout for Highgate Falls, and when you look at that, you probably understand why. That's taken from the top of Highgate Falls. This is the top. Down there, that's about 30 feet lower down. It doesn't really show. All the spray, that's bouncing back from the bottom. Um, Are you moving against that? I'm moving against that, yeah. <laughs> Well, well I, I carried on the bank around this particular, <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah, it was a day of painstaking pro pro progress. Um, I'd talked to myself, advising myself to have a lot of patience, out loud. Okay, first sign of madness, I know. But talking to myself, advising, patience, it was absolutely in essential that I didn't do anything rash and risk a swim. Because a swim, I, I'd certainly have lost the canoe and the pack. I could have lost more than that in conditions such as these. So that's, that's the kind of thing, again, I think progress had become impossible there, so I'm out on the bank um, doing another carry. Now, all day the rain continued, and I'm slogging upstream and upstream and upstream, carrying where necessary getting colder and colder, I can just feel my body temperature dropping and dropping and dropping all the time. And eventually, I got to the Abbey Rapids, which is somewhere west of Enosburg Falls. Couldn't make any more progress, so I took the canoe out and got up onto the, the bike path there, the old rail trail, and was carrying past the Abbey Rapids, and realized that I had the symptoms of hypothermia. Very, very intense shivering, coordination was beginning to go. 
So it was essential to get into, into some sort of shelter, and pretty soon. Obviously, if you can recognize the symptoms of hypothermia, it's not yet too bad. Before long, the Abbey restaurant came into view, amid the gloom, and without any thought other than warmth, I just put the canoe down and went in, and stood there, pack clothes dripping on their floor, shaking, trying to maneuver hot chocolate into my mouth. <laughs> it was not easy. <laughs> and um, I was asking about accommodation, and somebody, somebody suggested the dairy centre. It's only six miles up the road. <laughs> yeah, it's taken me all day to do 17. Somebody else suggested a motel a mile back in the other direction. OK, wrong direction, mile walk, I'll do it to get indoors for the night. But then a couple celebrating their 30th wedding anniversary came in for a meal and we got talking and they spared me either of those. They took me home with them for the night. <laughs> Trail angels. <laughs> so if Scott and Diane ever see this, this picture, thank you again. Next morning, they dropped me back at the Abbey restaurant and I continued the upstream. This is the point at which I established that the current in the middle of the river was well in excess of six miles an hour. So I, I cruise in that canoe at four miles an hour. If I sprint, probably a little over five. So once I was warmed up, I got in the middle of the river and sprinted as hard as I could and went steadily backwards. <laughs> so <laughs> at least six, probably seven miles an hour current. So under trees, behind trees, up the eddies, wherever they might have existed. That was my existence that day. And it was a long day, up past Enosburg Falls, and observed, totally unknown to me, by someone who was watching my online waypoints that I was leaving. More about those in a minute. There's a whole network of trail enthusiasts out there who were talking to each other and were following my journey. And the way they were following it was some GPS waypoints that I was leaving online. I used a spot. Some of you may have come across these. It doesn't tell me where I am. I've got the cheap model. But at the press of a button, I could leave online waypoints and um, so others could follow that on a website. And I, I could also summon the cavalry if needed. So it was a safety device. Um, I could summon my support crew to pick me up if needed. Whoops. Let's, let's try a pocket for this one. Okay. So that's me pushing off the bank, photographed by somebody who knew roughly where I was, came out and took a picture. He also took that one, and that, that sort of summarizes, summarizes the day. Long, cold, wet, lonely. That was a carry that, that was an extra carry that I was having to put in uh, because progress on the water had just become impossible. And so when I pulled into Richford, I'd just achieved about 20 miles of upstream paddling in one day in those conditions. And it was, um, it was a moment where I, I did allow myself a little bit of pride. I know it's one of the deadly sins, I don't care. <laughs> Let it strike me dead. <laughs> and there was an inn just across the, the road from the river, the Grey Gables, and my welcome was, here's a log fire, stand by it, I don't care that you're dripping all over the place, I'm off to get you a pot of tea and some muffins, just stay there and warm up. Doesn't get much better than that. So, um, so I had another night indoors. Next morning, that, that's Grey Gables. Next morning, I saw something I hadn't seen in all too long. Blue sky and sun. But, just because it's a nice day doesn't mean it's easy paddling. So I was back finding what eddies I could behind the trees and ended up having to carry some sections because the river had dropped a bit, it was now confined more within its banks, eddies were harder to find. So there were some parts of it which had to be along the road, luckily there is a road there, 
Route 105 and then 105A to the Canadian border. And after crossing into Canada, the paddling became easier. I wouldn't say easy, but at least it was possible in the eddies. And yes, this looks like a nice day. It was for a large part of it. And at the end of that day, I'd reached high water Quebec. And at the end of day nine now, this is day nine, I saw the first sunset of the trip. I was also privileged to see, around about the time of taking this picture, high water in high water, while a flock of Canada geese flew overhead in Canada. <laughs> Later that was supplemented by a moose beside the Moose River. <laughs> Now, that brings us to the next chapter. Oh, not quite. There. The only night in Canada. The next chapter takes us to the halfway point in terms of time and to, to the rest day. So it involves the Grand Portage. It involves northeastern Vermont getting down to the Connecticut Valley and a bit further. The, I'll tell you. Very shortly, <laughs> your, your question will be answered. So, day 10, finished off the Missisquoi, the upstream leg of the Missisquoi, still flooded, and that brought me to the Grand Portage. The Grand Portage is the longest official carry on the trail, 5.7 miles to get from the Missisquoi Valley over to Lake Memphremagog. It's on road, it's easy enough going, three miles of uphill, the rest downhill. Um, for carrying, I'd arranged my pack and canoe, everything, so that I could single the carries, do them in one, one go. A lot of people carry stuff, come back, and then carry more stuff, and so on. As soon as you double the carries, as it's called, you're doing three times the distance. Now, this trail has 55 miles of carry on it. That makes 165 miles of walking if you double them. There, back, and there again. So I arranged everything so that I could do it in one trip. One rucksack. My long paddle was stowed in the stern, tucked under the rear deck and the seat. Spare paddle and poles were in the front. Life jacket would be around the seat. And that way the balance was perfect. So when it was on my shoulders, I wasn't having to wrestle the balance. The canoe weighed 37 pounds. I think I missed saying this earlier, 37 pounds. It was 35 originally, and I added some reinforcement. My pack, when I started, weighed 48 and a half pounds, mainly because of two weeks' supply of food. Um, I only had one resupply, and that was two weeks in, in the Connecticut Valley. So that was a total of about 90 pounds, or about 60% of my body weight at the start. Of course, that went down as I ate the pack. <laughs> so... Lake Men from Agog arrived to about two hours later and paddled down the lake into a headwind. I got a south wind for once. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there are certain, certain elements of irony. And at Newport, right on the dock there, to answer your question, sir, is a video phone where you can check back into the US. And you just d press a button and your picture appears on the screen and you talk to somebody and you hold up your passport and in my case my green card as well and, and try and convince her that yeah, no I am a permanent resident, I'm not just a visitor no this address is not my holiday home <laughs> okay. but it was relatively straightforward once she understood me <laughs> and then I set off up the Clyde River as far as Clyde Pond for the night, that's actually the next mor morning um, and slept there for the night. Now the section upstream of Clyde River is it's recognized as being difficult. It's a fairly steep-sided valley, class two rapids, very rocky, fast water, um, difficult to make headway. I felt obliged to have a go at it. I didn't want to miss everything just by walking on the road, <laughs> so I had a go. I paddled upstream, did a bit of eddy hopping, um, got out, carried along the bank for a while, did a bit of wading, pulling the canoe. I couldn't, I couldn't actually line, uh, sorry, track the canoe upstream using bow and stern lines because the, 
as you can see, the banks are a bit overgrown. I was only going to get tied up. And worked my way upstream until eventually it became obvious that I really wasn't going to make any more progress. Certainly not on the water or in the water, <coughs> nor on the banks. Too steep and overgrown for carrying. So turned around, headed back downstream, rode the rapids, back to Clyde Pond, and went for a walk. It turns out that not all roads on maps actually exist. <laughs> and this turned into a seven mile carry the day after the Grand Portage. Here we've got me coming up the Clyde River to Clyde Pond looking for a campsite. Next morning, heading up the Clyde River until I couldn't get any further, coming back down. Then I thought I'd head back around here, around the south, and cut across and come up this road to get into Lake Salem. Well, this road disappeared into private property with gates. Um, so I had to backtrack and then take the long road north, which was the previous picture. That's the long road north. And then there was still too much current here to be worth getting in the river, so walked further and put in into Lake Salem. <laughs> My feet hurt at that point. <laughs> The Clyde River, however, is it's actually a very nice river, even though it was raining. Um, it's, there's a lot of swamp forest where route finding is difficult. This was actually not the recommended route, but it led me back onto the route which I'd lost earlier. Um, and some bits were flooded. Anyone who knows the Northern Forest Canoe Trail handbook, the guidebook, will recognize that bit of Clyde River. It's on the, it's on the front cover. And eventually, on the morning of day 12, Island Pond came into view. I would say glinting in the sunlight, but that would be an overstatement. Now, to access Island Pond itself, you actually have to go underneath the Clyde Hotel, which spans the river, <laughs> for whatever reason. And that's what it looks like under there. <laughs> but having got there, this was the highest point on the trail in Vermont. So now it's a downhill run to the Connecticut Valley. About three and a half miles of carrying further brought me to the Nulhegan River, which is a lovely remote winding river. Reasonable flow, not a lot of headroom, so there's plenty of water in it. But even so, some of the rapids further down were a bit too bony for my liking. So I took out and walked along the railway, the neighboring railway. And eventually, the next morning was able to resume where there was enough water in the Nulhegan to paddle again. All the way down to the Connecticut, which was flowing high in the morning mist and was a bit unnerving. It's flowing fast, had some rapids there, a few downed trees which had to be avoided, which weren't all that obvious in the mist. But the sun did eventually come out that day and it was a fairly quick downstream run. And fairly soon, I was heading upstream again on the Upper Amanusuk, so we're now turning across northern New Hampshire on the Upper Amanusuk, and this is Groveton, New Hampshire. Now, my original plan did not allow for any rest days. I was actually going to paddle, this is the Friday, I was actually going to paddle on the Saturday morning, get picked up, go and play the gig, and then get back on the water Sunday morning. Well, despite the conditions, I was still a little ahead of schedule. So I thought that a day of rest would actually be a nice thing to have. So I got in touch with my support crew, Ray and Hildy, who live over near the main border in New Hampshire, and we agreed to meet in Stark, further upstream. So set out, headed upstream, but soon I came across shallows, shallow water, no depth to sink a paddle into. And that was where it became necessary to start poling. Now, poling a canoe is a traditional way of progressing upstream. You stand in the canoe, use a 12-foot spruce pole or whatever, and you push off the bottom. And I've done it in a large stable canoe on flat water. In a small 14-foot less stable canoe on white water, it was probably not going to be the best recommended course of action. So I did it a different way. A couple of ski poles in a double poling action while, while kneeling. Not easy steering, but um, 
amazingly effective for going upstream and much lighter and easier to stow than a 12-foot pole. That's the only picture that exists of me doing this, and it was, it's a little blurry because it was taken from a distance. However, despite how effective this was, it was also effective at um, tiring me out. It takes a fair bit of upper body strength. And this was now a hot day. We're talking of up in the 80s. <laughs> and I took to wading where, when, the, when it got too, too tiring to pole. So I alternated between poling and wading. But I just wasn't making progress fast enough to make the rendezvous. So I took out on the nearby road and walked about five and a half, six miles, roughly the same as the Grand Portage again, to get to Stark. That's me arriving in Stark. Apparently, I was not looking very good at that point. Uh, quite apart from the exertions of the day, I just had the best part of two weeks of intensely hard paddling in largely horrendous conditions, weather-wise. And... Um, not always able to eat hot food and get hot drink. So my body was a bit depleted and very much in need of a rest day. There's Stark, that, that brings us to the halfway point. The rest day, what did I do? Let me see. I did some prodigious eating, I know that much. Bought some new rain pants, because mine had fallen apart. Um, did some more prodigious eating. Went and played the gig where there was more food to eat, so I totally failed to exercise moderation there. Um, and then went back to stay with Ray and Hildy that night. So it was the second night of comfort with them. And following morning, batteries recharged. They put me back on the trail in Stark. So it's me with batteries recharged, heading upstream once more, having just walked five and a half, six miles of the Upper Amanusik. I didn't want to miss any more, so I carried on poling upstream and poled and waded and paddled up the remainder of the river. I didn't, didn't portage any of it. And that brought me to West Milan, from where a four-mile carry brought me over to here, the Androscoggin Valley, ready for more upstream. <laughs> New if you don't count the Connecticut, then New Hampshire on the trail is upstream. And at the end of that day of upstream, Ray came and picked me up and took me home again. This is, this is luxury. I'm getting soft at this point. He took me home again for a night of comfort, albeit with no electricity. Knocked out by violent thunderstorms earlier in the day. <laughs> and yes, they did get me as well. Just in case you thought I'd struck lucky. And the next morning, he put me back, he took me back to where he'd picked me up, and I insisted on carrying around the, the bridge where he'd picked me up. I wasn't going to let him drive me the extra hundred yards and cheat. <laughs> and then he took a few photos of me as I carried on, carried on upstream. And it was another day of finding eddies where I could, hugging the bank all the way up, as this series of pictures shows. That's, that's me down there somewhere. That's me a little bit further up, right against the bank, still against the bank, and even smiling going upstream. For a lot of the Androscoggin, it was deep enough that I could use my, my big paddle, my long paddle, didn't have to resort to the white water. Whoops, long paddle. <laughs> um, didn't have to resort to my shorter white water one, so I made good progress. And Above Errol, the Androscoggin opens out into Umbagog Lake. And the far side of Umbagog Lake, there's another three-mile carry. There are a lot of three-mile carries on this trail. Past the Rapid River, some Class 4 rapids on the Rapid River. And that emerged into Lower Richardson Lake, where I stayed at a camp of a friend of Ray's in a little shack. And I, I took opportunities to get under cover when I could. 
um, because the nights were insanely cold, certainly low 40s, often down into the 30s. There were some nights I was surprised not to see frost in the morning. Um, most nights I actually slept with my head inside my sleeping bag, simply so that I could recycle the heat in exhaled air. <coughs> Next morning was bitter, <laughs> bitterly cold wind, driving rain a lot of the time, up Lower Richardson, Upper Richardson Lake, and then a long haul to the northeast of Mooslick McGuntic Lake. And if you're wondering about the wind, just, just look at the flag. <laughs> It's not merely fluttering, it's fluttering. <laughs> and from there, I took a hike to a Quasuk, which is on Rangeley Lake, through some road work. And the, the flag person radioed the other end as went past. There's a guy with a canoe on his head coming through. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, in, in a Quasuk, I took refuge in a cafe for a while, which was a great move because the sun came out for my trip along Rangeley Lake. And with this really strong wind now more or less behind me, I covered the 10 miles to Rangeley in an hour and three quarters without really trying. <laughs> Arriving a little bit wind blown. From there, another four mile carry took me to the Dead River, south branch of the Dead River, which was, this was a beautiful day's paddling. Oh, I forgot to say that this is going to be the first paddling day without rain. The first day without any rain at all was the rest day. <laughs> For those who are into irony. Okay, the Dead River, very beautiful river. A lot of people struggle with the water level being too low. I didn't have that problem. There were some great rapids. They were a bit bony in places, requiring some negotiation. And I did pick up some scratches on my canoe that day but it was otherwise a beautiful run down the Dead River all the way to Flagstaff Lake. And I stayed in an inn in Stratton that night. Stratton, we're now well up into Maine. And that was one of only two remaining indoor nights on the trail, which is why I took it. Next morning, negotiated Flagstaff Lake. It was calm for the 20 plus miles of Flagstaff Lake. And that took me to Long Falls Dam, carry around there. And it was just past there. This is the dam that created Flagstaff Lake in around about 1950, late 40s, 1950, flooding Flagstaff Village. Just past there, I came across a rapid, which was a, um, a class three rapid. Now, I'm, a, I'm okay up to class two. Class three in an open boat is a bit beyond my experience, other than a little bit below Middlebury Falls back in early May. But I could see down to the end of the rapid, the pool at the end, about 200 yards away. And this was just too enticing to miss. So I went for the wild ride and it was worth it. Took on board a bit of water, rucksack got a bit wet, but who cares? <laughs> it was getting wet from the rain anyway. Not that day. Further down the, oh, <laughs> yeah, wildlife. As yet, I had not seen a moose. But I'd seen plenty of bald eagles, plenty of mink, otter, a couple of fishers, um, beaver, including one that I startled on the bank, and it took the shortest route to water straight down the bank under my canoe. Um, herons, kingfishers, osprey, snapping turtle, the works, everything but moose so far. A bit further down, the Dead River is interrupted by Grand Falls. Here, I made a potentially serious mistake. Not that one. <laughs> I successfully carried around them. Just below these falls, I knew I had to turn left to go up Spencer Stream. But I was faced with an island, and the water was deeper on the right of the island, so I took the deeper water. And immediately around, around that island, I saw a rapid up ahead, so adopted whitewater protocol, life jacket, short paddle, kneel down, and started down this rapid, thinking, I don't recall any mention of a rapid here. So I pulled into this eddy and looked at the map, looked at the compass, back and forth a few times, and realized that I'd probably missed the entrance to Spencer Stream. A quick recce confirmed that. 
It was hidden behind the island. I was busy heading down one of the best white water runs in the northeast. <laughs> so I had to carry back up to get back to Spencer Stream, which is the last official upstream of the trail. And it had caused me some concern. How do I sort of not only navigate upstream in rocky conditions, but also how do I find the way when there are different streams joining? Um, it turned out to be far from the problem I'd envisaged. It was actually well, hard work, but enjoyable hard work, going all the way up to, up to Little Spencer Stream. That's, I spent the night at that confluence. That, that was the most remote camp of the trail. And then the next day, carried on more upstream, wading, poling, a little bit of paddling, all the way to Spencer Dam. This was the only carry that I doubled, about 20 yards of it because it involved negotiating up this steep rock face, <laughs> perching on a little ledge, tying up the canoe, heaving my rucksack out and carrying that to the top, and then somehow sliding my canoe up using some lichen there as a, a, a cushion, so I didn't scratch it up too badly. And put him back in the other side. Further north, <laughs> I've seen a moose. That was the first moose. Shortly after seeing that, I had another five and a half mile carry to get me to the Moose River. And here, I was, I was, I've been, the previous day and this day, I was pushing on for big mileage to try and reach Jackman at the end of the day here. Uh, it doesn't really show there, but it was raining, it was raining heavily, and it rained all the way to Jackman, Maine. Where, despite a local trying to convince me otherwise, I did in fact find a motel. <laughs> That was the last night of comfort on the trail. So there's about a week to go. However, the weather forecast at this stage was talking about Tropical Storm Andrea coming in, or Hurricane Andrea, whichever it was. It was going to be wet and windy. And I was getting fed up with wet and wind. So I thought, I'll make a dash to the end. And I reckoned I could reach the end. This was Saturday morning, I was making this decision. I could reach the end by Friday. So I got in touch with the support crew, but Ray confirmed that Vivica couldn't make the pick up until Saturday. So I had time to kill. What do you do when you've got time to kill and you don't like sitting around? Well, you get the maps out and you decide where else you can paddle. <laughs> <laughs> and I decided to throw in an extra loop. The main trail, this is further on, this is north end of Chesuncook Lake. The main trail comes up Umbazooksa Stream, Umbazooksa Lake. Across the infamous mud pond carry, nearly two miles of mud, into, through mud pond to Chamberlain Lake, I decided to go a different route and visit Allagash Lake and down Allagash Stream, which would add about 16 miles. It would use up a bit of the spare time I had. But that's, that's later. So, carried on down the Moose River, enjoying some nice bouncy rapids, able to take photographs while going down rapids at this point. Paddle in one hand, camera in the other. <laughs> Not enjoying the weather in Long Pond. Carrying around the more serious rapids further down. Another three mile carry. And camping on a little island in Brassure Lake. Good luck if you had a tent trying to camp there. Next day, carried on down the rest of the Moose River, all the way to Moosehead Lake. Checked in, signed the register at Rockwood and then paddled p up past Mount Kineo opposite and 17 miles to the north end of the lake which is out of sight up there. Under a sky which seemed to be indecisive at best. <laughs> By the time I hit the north end of the lake and the northeast carry, it was raining hard. <laughs> You've heard it before. And I made the carry to the west branch of the Penobscot in driving rain, plagued by Many, many mosquitoes. Oh. Can't see, oh, there they are. <laughs> I didn't realize I got them on film until expanding that picture at some point. So my initial perception of the West Branch of the Penobscot, oh, you can also see the raindrops coming down, streaking. Uh, my initial perception of the Penobscot was pretty dismal. Next morning, beautiful. Not only was it beautiful, 
there was the scent of balsam fir all the way down the valley. It was a gorgeous sensory experience going down that river. Um, of course, th these rivers in Maine are strips of wild land through a big logging industry. Uh, so you only have to go a few hundred yards back from the river and you meet logging activity. But where I was, it was great. That was a day on which I saw eight moose, <laughs> three in one go. And at the end of that day, I came to Chesuncook Lake and checked the weather report. It's worth noting this one. Weather report for the following day. 30% chance of showers after 1 p.m. Got that? 30% chance of showers after 1 p.m. So I headed up the revised route, camped for the night. Next morning, 7 o'clock, was the beginning of 32 hours of uninterrupted rain. <laughs> <sighs> Carried on upstream, this is up Kokongamok stream. More wading, poling, a little bit of paddling. And then up Sis stream, which reminded me of Eeyore's gloomy place. Rather boggy and sad, especially when I saw a moose wandering away. And that brought me to, eventually, after another three-mile carry, Allagash Lake, in now torrential rain. Uh, at this point, I'm getting quite cold. But I go and check in with the ranger. I paddle around the headland to check in with the ranger. And I sat with him for about an hour and a half, chatting, waiting for the rain to die down. It didn't. The only thing that subsided was my body temperature. Eventually, I just had to come back out into the rain, paddle to the north end of the lake, four and a half miles, to find a campsite, at which point I was once again hypothermic and very strongly recognizing it. So I strung up my tarp so I could get everything underneath it, grabbed a bag of dry clothes and ran for the outhouse. And there, in a space about three feet square and not exactly fragrant, stripped off all the wet clothes, replaced them with dry, and then got back under the tarp and cooked a meal, now using a little gas stove that I was carrying since resupply. <laughs> <laughs> so I could have hot food and drink and gradually warmed up. Next morning, well, the rain carried on all night. Next morning when I awoke, it was still going and I was not a happy bunny. It was perhaps the lowest point. I sort of, I toyed with the idea of just lying there forever. What was the point in getting up? It took me over an hour to summon up the motivation to get out of the sleeping bag. Make breakfast, use the gas stove again. And then, of course, before I could set off paddling, before I could finish packing, put on all those wet clothes that I'd left in the outhouse. And yet, oh, what's that doing there? Don't really need to see that. That's just where Allagash Lake is in the big scheme of things. When I set off that next morning, within a very few minutes, all of that cloud had lifted because I had something to think about other than self-pity. I had a challenging white water run down Allagash Stream. And with all the rain that there had been, it was a great run. And yes, I had to avoid overhanging trees, I had to avoid rocks, I had to carry around some ledges and some falls, but it was a wonderful run, and it stopped me wallowing in self-pity. Didn't last long enough, <laughs> soon emerged into Chamberlain Lake, near an old railway trestle, and yes, you can see the pockmarked water surface there again, and the camera is, by the way, wet at this point. It's a waterproof camera, but the lens is extremely wet. I carried over into Eagle Lake and then paddled north to Chamberlain Lake. The rain eventually stopped at 3 p.m., having started at 7 a.m. the previous day. That's 32 hours. And I managed to camp in the dry at the north end of Churchill Lake, just shy of the Allagash River, which really marks the end run. It's downstream from there to the end. So let's make a start on the final chapter. The Allagash, it's a beautiful river, class one and two rapids for a lot of it, swift water for some of it. 
all the way down to Ansaskis Lake. There, I made this momentous switch over to the final map in the 13 map series that covers the whole trail. And as it was a fairly nice day, tried to dry out my shoes. They hadn't seen much dryness. And then more downstream, more downstream, and carrying on downstream down this very beautiful valley until getting to Round Pond for the night. Now, Round Pond is a place where a lot of groups who are paddling the Allagash converge overnight. And to me, it felt crowded. After all the solitude I'd had, I'd seen almost nobody on the water. <laughs> you can't blame them, really. Um, but here it felt crowded, and all the campsites were taken. The guys who had this site offered to share with me. And what's more than that, they offered me some food. Some grilled, marinated beef. <laughs> and it was only then that I realized just what a protein craving I'd built up over the last three and a half weeks. There obviously wasn't enough of it in what I was eating. I'm clearly not following this, it's on a couple of pages behind. Just to make sure you got the whole thing. Okay, so yeah, moving on from Round Pond, carried on down river, down the rest of the Allagash, and um, it's part way down here that a ranger gave me the weather report. No rain for the next two days. This means dry to Fort Kent. <laughs> yeah, tempered with a certain amount of scepticism. <laughs> Within an hour, I was being rained on heavily. Had heavy showers for about an hour. But in between the showers, no, it's not upside down. <laughs> in between the showers, the reflections were quite stunning. There you go. <laughs> Just in case you didn't believe me. <laughs> Quite stunning. And it's, as I say, very beautiful. All the way past Allagash Falls, the final carry on the trail. Now, here's some more irony. At this point, my legs will carry pretty much anything anywhere. They've done so many multi-mile carries with the full weight. At this point, however, the, this carry is only about 300 yards. And my pack is almost devoid of food. <laughs> I've just eaten my last breakfast portion. The pack is as light as it's going to be, more or less. What a waste of good legs. <laughs> Further downstream, more Allagash, until it meets the St. John River at Allagash Village, where I spent my last night. I found the diner, which was going to be the, the place where I'd have my final evening meal and the brec breakfast the next morning, just as it was closing. <laughs> Got there at 3 o'clock. At this point, my blood sugar was low, and I had hardly any food in my pack. I managed to find the, the village store, which offered me little more than chocolate. <laughs> but the store owner could see I was struggling, so I dug into his personal supplies and sold me a couple of packets of ramen noodles. And that's when the feasting began. <laughs> Brewed up ramen noodles, my last half portion of dried food, and had chocolate for hors d'oeuvre and chocolate for um, dessert. Next morning, final morning, dawned nice and clear. Maybe this is going to be one of those days with no rain, as the ranger predicted. After a good di uh, breakfast at the diner, then, um, which was open in the morning eventually, I took a couple of commemorative pictures of my canoe just to, just to celebrate it. Um, I'd sort of developed a, an attachment to the canoe by this point, and I dubbed it the little canoe that could and did. And then we set off. We set off. The canoe and I. Set off down the St. John River. Nice riffles. Very, very strong wind. Not always being helpful. So the wind had to have its final say. And because the support crew couldn't guarantee to be at the end until three o'clock, I had a bit of time to kill, so I played around with the camera, took a few, few sort of autobiographical pictures, if that's what they are. And, um, oh, <laughs> you 
Yeah, the wind had its final say. The rain also had to have a last word. That one nailed me perfectly. About half an hour of really intense rain, soaking everything once more. Meanwhile, the support crew, Vivica, Hildy and Ray, had made good time. And they had reached Fort Kent by midday and were sitting there. They kept up a three-hour vigil. They were watching the storm that nailed me, thinking, yep, that's where he is. <laughs> they just kept up that vigil. That they, they were the support crew who had had my back throughout. I didn't have to call on them to be picked up or to bring repair materials, but knowing that they were there and would have done anything I needed was a comfort through the miles. At this point, I think just to round it off, I'm gonna, just going to read from the journal that I kept and kept dry as it happens. As the rain dies, I take the opportunity to tidy up the canoe, eject any stray vegetation, pack away anything that's loose, adjust my pack for optimum trim. It's a matter of pride that everything be shipshape for arrival. Then, suddenly realizing that I'm not as far downstream as I thought, the brakes are released. I open up to a full paddling stroke and, with tears rolling down my face, set about bringing the trip home in style. Every few minutes, as I consider what I've achieved, a lump rises in my throat, but it's not just for me. Every time I think of how my canoe has performed, how it has carried me down the white water of the Saranac, over the swell of Lake Champlain, up the eddies of the flooded Missisquoi, through the swamps of the Clyde River, across the expanses of Richardson, Mooslet McGuntic, Rangeley, Flagstaff and Moosehead Lakes and more. How it has been eased over rocks on upstream white water. How it has been my shelter from rain on long carries. All of this causes surges of powerful emotion. I have an emotional attachment to this canoe, the little canoe that could and did. I spare a thought too for my paddle, how it has served me over the many years, how it has relished the deep water of the lakes and the Androscoggin River and more, and now how it's propelling me towards the culmination of an achievement that will live with me forever. And then it's just paddling, paddling, paddling until the Fort Kent St. Clair Bridge comes into view. I'm paddling strongly now, definitely coming home in style, tears still blurring my vision at times. I snap a picture of the Fort Kent Customs Building, pass under the bridge, only half a mile to go now. Only half a mile to go now. I have no idea of what I'm looking for, but I'm confident that I will recognize it when I get there. And then, at an innocuous little clearing on the right bank, I see two figures. There's no mistaking Vivica and Ray. Hildy eludes me for the time being. I make a beeline for them, still paddling strongly, but easing off just a little. It's 3.10 p.m. when I step out of the canoe for the last time on this trip and into a long-awaited hug from Vivica. Hildy and Ray are next, Hildy pausing her camera duty for just long enough. This is the support team that has had my back throughout and even though I've not had to call on them for rescue or repair, the knowledge that they were there and willing to do whatever was necessary has been a comfort through the miles. During this reunion, I've been feeling a little callous. My canoe is sitting there by the river, ignored. Four weeks of dedicated service, and now I merely step away from it into the arms of others. I return to it once more. There's one last carry that we have to make together. My paddle secured in the stern, my pack on my back, and being understood when I decline the office of help, I hoist the little canoe once more to walk with, this time Vivica by my side, up to the kiosk, the official end of the trail. There follow the ceremonial pictures, sending the final spot, quick fire answers to the so many questions that come my way, signing the register, discussing equipment successes and failures, in the middle of all of this, I sit down by the canoe, cradling my paddle, and have a quiet emotional moment with the equipment that has carried me far and has brought me safely home. It's a moment that I have known for a long time would happen, but only now do I realize the intensity of the emotion that accompanies the disbanding of this close-knit team. 
Yes, we'll paddle together again, but maybe never again will we share the trials and tribulations, the delight and despair, the hard work and the easy cruising, the hundreds of solitary miles of the last four weeks. Thank you.